afternoon. Uh, I'm going to wake you up. I've got some fantastic pictures, so I hope you're going to wake up. Um, I want to say something. Listen to you know my three you know, co-panelists speak. Fabulous. They've taken away a lot of my words anyway. It's interesting. Social entrepreneurship or not, uh, for profit or not. You know, our ideas are quite a lot the same. We've all come through. Nobody's born an entrepreneur, uh, like Prachi also mentioned. I mean, it's something that hits you. It's some part in life that you stumble onto something and you say, yes, this is a kicker idea. I wasn't born an entrepreneur at all. I, a little bit about me, I come from a technology background. I did my master's in computer applications. I did um, honors in maths. I don't know what I was doing then. But um, went on, stayed in the IT industry in the US for about many years, 15 years. Came back. When I came back from, from the US is, um, um, is when you know, a lot of things that you take for granted in this country, you kind of, somehow you, you're sitting in a car and you see a person begging on the streets. And you, you sort of assume that there's a system behind it, everything will get fine, and you turn the other cheek and you move on. When you come back from a country like the US and you realize that, no, there's something that needs to be done. The seed was planted then. But I want to tell you, I don't want to run this like a lesson that I want to give you. If I share my story with you, maybe you'll take some pointers. So if I can get this clicker to work. Okay, Story Brand 17,000 Feet Foundation. I'm the founder of this organization called 17,000 Feet. Obviously, yes, we work in Ladakh. Story started with the solo trek into the Himalayas. I trekked in the, uh, I did a 21-day trek in the Himalayas in 2010. And it was a pretty tough experience for me simply because I didn't acclimatize. For most of you who don't know, uh, Ladakh is not easy trekking into. You need to acclimatize for two days. Now, I'm a trekker. I went in there all gung-ho. Yeah, I can do this. In day two, um, I landed up at 16,000 feet, could barely breathe. I survived pulmonary edema. These are some of the pictures that we just went into remote Ladakh. This is not the Ladakh that three idiots shows you. This is the way some people cross to go to their homes or schools. That's me out there. It's pretty scary. I was stuck on it for a few hours. Little, you know, these bridges that you think. I, so I trekked solo for about eight days. None of these places had connectivity. None of them had electricity. So I really didn't know if I was stuck, what would happen. That's a pass, what is known as pass. Ladakh means the land of high mountain passes. This is a high mountain pass. Because of my pulmonary edema, I could not make that pass. It was tough for me to just cross over. It was maybe 20 steps away. I ran into the school. Mind you, this is the sum total of the whole school. Six kids, one teacher. I stayed there for, for the day. I camped, pitched my tent there. This guy, uh, there are no roads that lead to this place. And I said, how many children? He says, seven. How many teachers? He says, three. I said, what are you talking about? The youngest is somewhere here and the oldest is in grade five. It's a primary school um, in a village called Hankar. He had three teachers. Two teachers, I met them. They were on the way back. Going back to Leh, which takes them two days of hiking, walking, trekking, hitching a ride just to get back midday meal supplies. And this guy, he hadn't reached home. He comes from Leh, Leh is the city. And he said, look, I haven't seen tomatoes in a long time. Do you have any tomatoes with you? He said, I have a bottle of uh, Nescafe with me. I can trade. He's talking of trade. This is 2010, mind you. I said, my God. I said, keep the Nescafe. Here are some uh, tomatoes. I had some Hakka noodles with me. I made the noodles and fed these kids. One of the kids get their little children home, uh, from home to the school. The kid just sleeps there the whole day. He gets a midday meal. Point I'm trying to make is this school. Um, seven kids, everyone goes to school. There wasn't one child in that village who was not going to school. It blew me on my mind. I survived this trek. And mind you, I survived. It was pretty bad case of pulmonary edema. I came back and I said, I got to do something. This is insane. What, what century are we living in? I came back. That was just one or two schools that I saw. The way did the flood, there was a flash floods of uh, August 2010, you recall? I had by then, you know, quit my IT job and I'd gotten into teaching. I didn't want to get back to the corporate world. I kind of thought I'd seen it all. I was teaching in the Sri Ram school and I said, here's my chance. I took a whole bunch of kids. We adopted seven schools. Here's a picture again. This slide is mainly pictures, so you'll enjoy this. This is about... Can you read that? Temperature is well below minus 20 degrees. We go all the way there to reach this remote school, which is 100 students. That's one of a very large school, mind you. We could only go this far. 
we were carrying supplies for that school uh, on, uh, on two vehicles. But we had to uh, take, uh, download all the saman simply because we couldn't go any further. The villagers were waiting for us with horses. Can you spot our car? Sure. Can you spot the vehicle? <laughs> yeah. We had to leave it there for five days because we had to trek further to go into the village. Five days. The, the little one vehicle remained there. We trekked for two days. The villagers had got their 25 horses. Everything was put onto those 25 horses. And we walked for two days to reach this incredible school. This is the top of a pass. It's a dizzying climb down. People make this journey every day. Can you see that? Oh it's insane going down. It's insane coming up. I don't know which is worse. This is called the Kupala. It's about 16,000 something feet. Three idiots does not show you this. The only place I think Ladakh has become popular post this. There were these hundred school students waiting for us for a good five hours. We told them we'll reach there. There's one emergency satellite phone in that village, just one. We told them we'll be reaching there. We reached six hours late. Uh, I had a team of people with me and they were waiting just to greet us because nobody had ever reached there ever. This is some of all the stuff we carried on horseback. Books, clothes, games. We designed furniture for them for all of their rooms. That's the, the village, Lingshe, that's it's about. The villager had come out to greet us. They were so grateful. It is incredibly humbling. I can't say it in any other way. To think that people live like this and they were so grateful for a little bit of an intervention from our side. That's the pictures of the children carrying because the final, the last mile into their classrooms, we could not even carry it from the ghoda, from the horses. They had to carry it on their heads. One chair, one table. You want to do something, don't we all? I think everyone has a social streak inside us. It's buried somewhere inside. There's, there's a knock. I had my knock. I want to do something. I want to have this magical solution that would change the education system. I saw this, you know, teachers walking for three days to reach somewhere and come back and, uh, you know, uh, come back with midday meal supplies. They go in pairs because they have to even get their gas cylinders back. Okay, so you can't carry it alone. So I go back home and I tell my husband and my family, I got to do something. So this is what I got from them. Yeah, right. This is Ladakh you're talking about. Okay. Do you even know what we're getting on? My, my husband is also a trekker. He has far more experience in Ladakh as a trekker for almost 25 years. But, um, I mean, like... Uh, Abhishek just said, I mean, he didn't get into this for a social cause. I dragged him into this venture, by the way. But he knows the terrain very well. He says, you don't know what you're talking about. He himself had been to many schools. I said, something has got to be done. Problem was, we really didn't know what. So it's easy. You have an idea. Like Monica says, like the topic of this commission, how do you turn it into something that works? I had an idea and the passion and really no idea how to go about starting to do anything about it. So I started visiting people. By which time I quit the Sriram school, I went to people and said, you got to do something for Ladakh and I got no answers. Uh, no takers really. Ladakh? Are you kidding? That's what I got. So I said, forget it. You want to do something yourself? Just get up and go do it yourself. So first thing, what do you do when you start out? Know your terrain. Know your people. Know your customers. Know what you're dealing with. Start doing our research. Just get into this. This is the only few slides. This is a bit about Ladakh that you probably don't know. Altitude of Ladakh is upwards of 9,000 feet. There's nothing below. Here you're standing at 800 feet. So do the math. You really can't breathe. It's not that easy. You can't run around when you're there. Temperatures are, are, go up to minus 40 degrees. We train there when it's minus 25. Schools are open when it's minus 15. Here in Delhi, everyone screams blue murder if it reaches even two or three. Yeah. Right, our kids don't go to school. Severe winters. Right now the school is shut all the way till February. <coughs> Many villages shut down for six months of a year. So what do these guys do? Only 80% of the villages are reachable by road. Like the village I just told you, some of them require a trek. Some of them maybe need a four hour trek, but you can drive till, till about that place. Villages. Now Ladakh take an idea at 65,000 square kilometers. That is bigger than the state of Haryana. Okay. And guess the population is only 3 lakhs. If only Gurgaon or Delhi were so scarcely populated, we wouldn't have such traffic nightmares. Some villages have just 100, maybe 150, 200 homes. 
They don't, most of them don't have electricity. They are powered by solar power for three to four hours. Majority of them do not have cell phone connectivity. I'd love to take both of your solutions, Subhi and uh, Abhishek, we'll talk to you later. But, you know, this is the one thing, and I absolutely agree with you. I mean, the mobile, it is the connectivity is a must. There's so much that can be done. But with most of the things that we're talking about, they don't have it. No public transport. What do they do? They are dependent on tourism. You're aware, most people want to visit Ladakh and be a tourist and see the Khardungla, right? Highest motorable road in the world. But that is six months of a year. What do they do the remaining six months? Nothing. They hibernate. It's too cold. Nobody wants to go there. And it's like a ghost town. Their only other jobs are government. Education. This place has 1,000 schools. When we did our research, it blew our minds. 1,000 schools, I ran into 10. What are we trying to achieve here? The problem looked huge. 1,000 schools, out of which 93% are rural and remote. Fine, I can go fix one school, I can go fix two. Am I really helping the system? Look at the PTR. PTR is as low as six students to a teacher. That's it. I mean, if you look at our schools, we have 50, 40, 35 kids. Ladakhis go to any extent. Here are some... Do you see that village? That's about 800, 900 year old village. Um, that is a school. Right there. It has 54 children. Call for Toksar. Yeah, that's the school. It's been around for a long time. Here's yet another school on the Chushul border, on the China border. Very, very remote and ignored. It's just nothing for miles. Here's a beautiful lake that you saw in Pangongso, which is the Three Idiots Lake. He showed you a fabulous school which receives a huge amount of funding every year thanks to Three Idiots and a lot of others. But around that lake are four schools. This one has only five kids and one teacher. It functions every time. Here are some kids. They do not have any occasion to come out. They don't receive visitors. They don't see anything outside their villages and their homes. But every child goes to school because they are desperate for education. The parents are desperate. These are how teachers travel. In some cases, this is the Zanskar River. I'm giving you a situation of the problem that exists. The Zanskar River gets, it freezes up in Jan and Feb. And you see that parents make that trip to drop their children off to a private school if they can afford it. Walking the frozen ice, many fathers have died. This is a situation we're dealing with. People traverse this. They, some are airdropped. Some teachers are actually airdropped because the passes are closed. Here's a big problem. Problems with the education system. They deal with an English medium. But most of them are first generation learners. Teachers can't speak in English very well. The textbooks are really thick. The children are first generation learners. They have no parents to help them. The teachers cannot speak in English. They're not graduates. They're not trained. So what comes out of the system are high dropout rates, high failures. 33% of them pass the 10th grade. It's really low. It has gone up from 5% to 33% in the past 20 years, which is not much. So understanding it, understand your ecosystem. We have the parents, like the ecosystem of the education system, the children. The administration who is struggling to attend to these 1,000 schools across 65,000 square kilometers. Then there are the teachers. And there is one interesting aspect of Ladakh which you probably won't see anywhere, which is the visiting travelers and trekkers, which, have now, which are part of the ecosystem. Ladakh is visited by trekkers, fools like me who go in there and we come back feeling impassioned to work. And they do volunteer in, in places that they know about. But they don't know what they're volunteering. They don't know what to teach. They stay for 10 days and leave. And they feel they've sort of done good. Um, but they're part of the ecosystem. And there are too many unemployed graduates who can really be tapped to be a part of the solution. This is the ecosystem we're dealing with. The problem was as big as the terrain. This was my problem. Location, location, location. Ladakh <coughs> everywhere through. But we were determined to find a solution. These are the problems. Schools were too remote, too tough to reach. Too many schools, thousand schools. School strengths were too low. What do you do when the entire school strength is five kids, 20 kids? Can I go to a company and say, please fund an entire school for five kids? I'm sorry, the numbers just don't make sense. I'm sure the companies will not. They say, how many students have I impacted? Five. Sorry, I am doing it. Cost of travel to remote areas was too high. Nobody worked in the remote schools. Everybody was working in the three idiot schools. Right? Sorry, Amir Khan is going to kill me for this reference, <laughs> multiple references. There were too many young children staying all alone in lay and struggling. 
looking at this, the problem seemed, you know, huge. It seemed huge. But as you walked around and we, as we looked at various other not-for-profits and what they were doing, and said, what are, we, what are you guys doing? How do you do? But they were dealing with uh, Maharashtra or Karnataka or Delhi or Haryana. And everywhere I looked at, I had no parallel. But then we realized maybe we were looking at the wrong problems. Maybe we just needed to change the way we looked at the problem. So here's what we did. We had a Eureka moment. We can't change the terrain, except it. Except the fact that it is far away, except the fact that the altitudes are too much. Now how do we work with it? What if we could create an awareness about these tiny schools and find a way to reach out to each and every one of them? One of the reasons why these schools are performing so badly was nobody knew they existed. I didn't. I, my husband been checking that for 30 years, he didn't. What if I found a way to do that? What if we could break down the problems into smaller units, make it into manageable modules and try and go for it? And I'm not the only one. There are tons of people who can be involved. How can I involve others and try and find a solution? That's what we did. 372 schools of lay district. All 372 schools we visited took us three and a half months to go look at them. This technology. I come from an IT background. It doesn't need me. It doesn't stay too far behind me. We mapped the whole lot. What if we could open it up to people? We created this, Map My School. We call it Map My School, connecting all schools in a single platform. There are a lot of people who go in there and feel like they need to help. What if we gave them a way to do it? This is our Map My School. Put it on a Google Earth platform, open it up and say, if you know, do you know where you're going? Going to Pangong So Lake, do you know there's a school on the way? If that school is five kids, just take a box of crayons, take a football, they'd really help. Would you do it? If I gave you that information, would you do it? If you went there and did some fabulous work, can you collaborate with others? Can you share with others and say, look, I went there. I have these pictures, no way to send it. Email me, I'll send you the pictures. Go there and deliver those pictures. So you, yeah? I request you to. Okay, wrap it up. This is how we do this. This is basically crowdsourced. Um, we get a lot of data from this. Our biggest thing is getting a lot of data and using it now to plan what we need to do. Okay, what we have done based on this, we broke down the problems. What are the things that we can do? We, we set up libraries, uh, we train teachers, we've taught them in English. We've actually done infrastructure improvements, saying, okay, fine, you need, you need uh, furniture, you need uh, playgrounds, that's what we've set up. These are some of the pictures. We've set up libraries in 100 schools today. It's just our second year. A library is justice. Each school has got 500 books. These are teachers. It's me training. We've taken furniture to those schools, set up playgrounds, rebuild schools. And then our key thing, what if we could involve people and what if we could manage our volunteer? What if we could manage the way people volunteer at these schools? Collaborating with others. Volunteerism. Some of you may have heard it, it's volunteer tourism. If you know you want to go to Ladakh, don't just be a tourist, be a volunteer tourist. You can help these people, you can help 17,000 feet. Combining a vacation with an opportunity to do good. So way to see and experience the real Ladakh. So this is it. So the benefit to the volunteer is you feel good. You don't just go there to see a lake and feel, I've done, you know, I've done a checkbox tourism. There's a benefit to the remote school. The village gets income because you stay at a village. And this is a revenue stream for us, which helps us manage our back-end costs. We conduct a lot of workshops, the modules are built, and we help people go ahead. So this is our model. These are just pictures of how you stay, how you work at the school. You can go tell stories to kids. You can go and create a science workshop or do an art program with them. 15 days because it's modularized, we're working with the government, it's blessed by the government because it's continued by our own team. So I'll stop here. So ultimately what worked for us was actually location, location, location. So it is Ladakh. We turned around the fact that it's very tough. We're now two years old and I think our, uh, um, I think the strong point that has come in is just the fact that we have built a credible organization because we spent two years working on the ground and understanding it. And today, uh, we are getting noticed, which is a good thing, because we need that. So the rest of it, you know, I don't have to say what everything, I'm all running out of time, but everything else has been said by them. And, you know, when, when that little hammer hits you in the head, go for it. The solution will fall in place. All right, thank you.